Excellent. We'll get started here in just a moment. I want to take a look at our map so far for those that have been participating in the poll. So I think if we advance to the next slide, you can see that we have participants from all over the world. So please um, continue to send your responses into the poll and we'll actually use it for a few more questions throughout today's session. Now that we've given everybody a chance to join, I want to note that this session is being recorded and there is access to closed captioning. You can find the menu for that on the bottom of your screen. And with that, we will get started here in about 30 seconds. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Greetings from the World Food Prize in Des Moines, Iowa. Uh, I'm Mike Michener. I'm Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at the U.S. Agency for International Development. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to this World Food Prize side event, Agricultural Innovation for African Sustainability and Resilience, hosted by the Board for International Food and Agricultural Development. I'm originally from Southeast Iowa, and I am so pleased to be speaking to you in person from my home state, where I've been attending World Food Prize side events in person this week. I can't tell you how proud it makes me as an Iowan to see the entire state embrace the legacy and promise of Norman Borlaug's life's work. I would like to thank Barbara Stinson and her team at the World Food Prize for hosting the Borlaug Dialogues this week. I would also like to honor and offer congratulations to this year's laureate, Dr. Shakuntala Park Singh Pilstead. We are so excited to celebrate her accomplishments together this week. USAID Bureau for Resilience and Food Security Chief Scientist Rob Bertram and I had the pleasure of interviewing doc, uh, Dr. Tilstead and last year's laureate, Dr. Rattan Lal, yesterday in another side event. I'd also like to give thanks to, to BIFAD for hosting this event. For those of you who may not be familiar with it, BIFAD is a seven member U.S. Presidentially Appointed Federal Advisory Committee to USAID. BIFAD was established under the U.S. Foreign Assistance Act and aims to help USAID bring the assets of U.S. universities to bear on critical challenges in food and agricultural development. I personally witnessed these contributions from the university community in visits to Feed the Future Innovation Labs at Purdue University and the University of Illinois last week on my road trip from Washington, D.C. to Des Moines. I'd like to recognize and thank my Fed Chair, Dr. Mark Keenum, President of Mississippi State University for his leadership of the board. And I'm very pleased that BIFAD member, Dr. Pamela Anderson is with us today. Also in the audience are BIFAD members, Jim Ash and Mark McDaniel. We are glad to have you all with us today. BIFAD's program of work includes advising USAID on the implementation of our global food security strategy. Given promising trends of sustained accelerated economic transformation in Sub-Saharan Africa, BIFAB wanted to better understand what is driving this sustained agricultural growth. They wanted to know if economic transformation in Africa was similar to Latin America and Asia, and what role agricultural production and growth were playing in this transformation. So BIFAD commissioned a study to explore the current evidence for linkages among agricultural growth economic transformation and resilience to shocks, to distill lessons learned from country case studies, to examine the relationships to gender equality and women's economic empowerment, and to consider the implications for USAID programming priorities. We were extremely lucky that the best talent in this area agreed to support the study. We are pleased to welcome the study co-authors led by Dr. Tom Jane at Michigan State University, who are here with us today to kick off a discussion that builds on other presentations at the UN Food System Summit Science Days and the Agra Forum. As you know, the Borlaug Dialogues this week are coming on the heels of the UN Food System Summit, which emphasized the need for system level change to achieve the sustainable development goals. At the UN Food System Summit, USDA Secretary Tom Vilsack and USAID Administrator Samantha Power reinforced the US commitment to work with domestic and international partners to tackle hunger and poverty and build more sustainable, equitable, and resilient food systems at home and abroad. The US government committed $10 billion in multi-year initiatives to strengthen food security and nutrition for all 
accelerate climate change mitigation and adaptation, and expand inclusive food systems at home and abroad, especially for the most vulnerable. The summit highlighted the ongoing threats of COVID-19, conflict, and climate change that have already increased poverty, hunger, and malnutrition across the globe with a disproportionate impact on women and girls. At the summit, there was a recognition of the critical need for investments in science and innovation to achieve the SDGs. And that's why the thematic focus area of research and innovation is so very timely and resonant in this year's Borlaug Dialogues. What brings us together today is compelling evidence of a strong linkage between agricultural productivity growth, poverty reduction, and food security. It's well established that countries with higher level productivity growth see reductions in poverty and have more resilient food systems. We also know that two types of investments are underlying drivers of agricultural productivity. First is an enabling environment of inclusive regulatory policies, infrastructure, roads, and power. Second is investments in research and innovation. What we hope to achieve today is a deeper understanding of how governments, donors, and private sector can influence these drivers of productivity growth. The questions we should ask are, what is working well? What are some of the constraints? How do we achieve greater political commitments to these kinds of decisions and investments? And how do we foster great capacity, coordination, communication, and connection to promote innovation? To lead us through these ideas, I'm delighted to introduce and welcome our moderator for today, uh, Ms. Lulama Nidibungo Traub. Ms. Traub serves as the chair of the Technical Committee for the Regional Network of Agricultural Policy Research Institutes, or RENAPRI. RENAPRI is an African-led, African-driven group of national agricultural policy research institutes. The vision of RENAPRI is to support national agricultural policy research institutes in Africa to be centers of excellence that guide and inform national and regional agricultural and food security policy issues. Ms. Traub also lectures at the University of Stellenbosch and conducts research with the South African Bureau of Food and Agricultural Policy, where her research interests include capacity building programs in collaboration with Southern African universities and government agencies, mainly focusing on staple food marketing and trade policies. Lulama, welcome and over to you. Great, thank you, Michael. And thank you for, for, for providing the context for today's conversation. As a representative of the RENAPRI network, it's really a great pri privilege to be on this virtual platform and join in such a critical conversation. What's equally exciting for me is to see the global audience that has joined us today. Based on the responses from the earlier poll, and our registration list, we have participants tuning in from the far corners of the globe. Beyond the US, we have attendees from Cameroon, China, DRC, Ethiopia, Germany, France, Italy, Kenya, Lebanon, to name but a few. And I myself, as you mentioned, Michael, am joining you from the beautiful wine country of Stellenbosch, South Africa. So welcome to everyone. But not only is our virtual room global in scope, but we also have a dearth of stakeholders representing national governments, nonprofit organizations, private sector, and academia. So beyond the insights of our presenters and panelists today, we aim to really tap into the deep expertise of our virtual audience. In this way, through the diversity of the collective, we aim to arrive at innovative and concrete recommendations on how to, number one, improve the capacity of African government ministries and agencies to promote technical innovation. Secondly, to achieve a balance, how do we achieve this balance in research partnerships between international research institutions and national agricultural research systems? And last and thirdly, but not least, is how can we then effectively communi communicate our research results back to policymakers in order to influence policy change and investments? So to begin, I would like to share today's program. Next slide, please. Right. 
Now that we've well and truly been welcomed, we want to start by setting the scene. And to do this, the authors of the BIFED report will present the evidence of the catalytic role of agriculture research and development in really driving food system transformation in Africa. This then will be followed by a panel discussion where our panel of experts will identify concrete actions that national governments and regional organizations international partners and private sector can undertake. Through all of this, we want to strongly encourage audience contribution to the conversation. Through the interactive polling, uh, polling questions and the audience Q&A session, we really want to garner that collective thinking on this issues. And to do this, next slide, please. We would like to ask our virtual attendees to really use that Q&A function to post questions for the presenters or the panelists. Use the chat function to share your ideas, answers to the questions that we're posing to the panelists, and or share any additional resources that you have that can contribute to the conversation that we're having today. And finally, to move this conversation beyond just this webinar, we really do welcome the audience to share your thoughts on Twitter using the handler food, hashtag foodprize2021. Next slide, please. So to begin, I would like to now hand over to Professor Tom Jane, the lead author, as uh, Michael had mentioned, on the BIFED report. Tom, who besides being my advisor and mentor, is the University Foundation Professor of Agriculture, Food and Resource Economics at Michigan State University. He is also adjunct professor at the Indaba Agricultural Policy Research Institute in Lusaka, Zambia, a board member of RENAPRI, and was the founding, um, was the founding co-director of the Alliance for African Partnerships at Michigan State University. And in 2019, Tom was seconded to the African Development Bank to serve as the special advisor to the president. Tom, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Lulama. Thanks, and nice to see you and everyone. Uh, Mike Mishner, thanks so much for your introduction. Um, we're very grateful to the BIFAD and USA team for inviting us to share uh, our, our res results with, uh, with this uh, group. Um, I was one of four authors of this report that we're going to summarize, and I'd like to just quickly introduce uh, my colleagues who were you know, really a pleasure to work with in this BIFAD report. Uh, first, let me introduce Louise Fox, uh, who is with the Brookings Institute and also UC Berkeley. Louise, welcome. Uh, Keith Fuglier, uh, who is at the US uh, Department of Agriculture and my colleague at Michigan State University, uh, Soji Adelaja. Um, it's been a, so uh, I'm going to turn over to them in just one second. Uh, I just wanted to say if I could boil down in one sentence, what the main message of our report uh, would be, uh, it would be that uh, one of the most crucial necessary conditions, not sufficient, but necessary conditions for promoting resilience and sustainable food systems and economic transformation in Africa. If you could boil it down to that one necessary condition, it would be technical innovation throughout the entire uh, food system, um, you know, in African agricultural systems, but especially on African farms. And uh, that is obviously easier said than done about how to get there because uh, yield growth in Africa has really lagged behind the rest of the world. So I'd like to turn over to uh, my colleague Louise to go into sort of uh, the beginnings of our, um, of our uh, results. Louise, floor is yours, thank you. Thank you. Could I have the next slide, please? OK, so what we're going to do in this presentation is really highlight two of the key messages from the report. Um, and we will also summarize some of the priority actions that uh, governments need um, to take to move forward, in our view. Next slide. So we start with the macroeconomic high level evidence. We're looking back. And what we think is really important here is that our finding is that there is very strong evidence of two decades, in other words, up to the COVID period, of, of economic growth, of poverty reduction, 
and of transformation of the economy that led to real improvements in material welfare um, in the region. And we think that this uh, success was underpinned by two things, which we wanna highlight today. Uh, one was um, strong agricultural growth. And the second one was um, measures that were taken within the economic policy, including uh, measures for macroeconomic stability and also uh, measures to, uh, at the micro level to increase productivity in sectors. Um, that created a much more resilient growth in Africa in the past two decades than Africa had had before. And this is what contributed to the improvements in material welfare. And so our bottom line, as Tom said, is that Africa needs to get back on this track uh, in a post-COVID year, and that agriculture and agriculture innovation are key to that. Next slide. So here's the first piece of evidence that you may or may not know, which is that um, during the period 2000 to 2018, Sub-Saharan Africa was the growth leader in terms of agricultural production growth. Okay, next slide. And what happened is that growth really supported and underpinned total economic growth in the economy. And you can see that in the slide on the left-hand side, where you have uh, growth in the agricultural sector, which is in orange, and growth in the overall economy, GDP, which is in blue. And they track each other quite closely. We've done this analysis with different periods of moving average, a five-year moving average, and with the economy, uh, it, with no moving average, no smoothing. And we see the same thing. And we think this pattern is really important because it says that agricultural growth can really support the economy. We also, on the right-hand side, show that agricultural growth supported a decline in the extreme poverty rate. I should note that these projections were made before COVID. Maybe they're not going to be so optimistic now. But what you see is that um, starting in around uh, 2000, you see a major change in the slope of poverty reduction, an increase in poverty reduction, which is related to the increase in agricultural growth and GDP that you see on the left-hand side. Next slide. Now, we think that um, the increased resilience of African growth and is what contributed substantially to that upward trend, which we just saw. What you see in this slide is the standard deviations in uh, growth. Uh, and this is in 10 year periods. So there's a 10 year moving average um, between 1990 and uh, 2020. And what you see is that both GDP growth and agricultural growth had a lot of volatility, a lot of ups and downs. And these ups and downs were really harmful uh, to the economy uh, to, and to agricultural families and urban families, non-agricultural families, in terms of their ability to improve their material welfare. They, because of course the downturn slowed down growth uh, a lot. Um, so what you see is starting around, uh, um, around 2000, the volatility started to drop because of it, this improved management that we spoke about. Uh, including um, uh, support for the agricultural sector. And so you see uh, the volatility dropped a whole lot um, and stayed low, which allowed this growth performance that you saw on the previous slide until 2020. What's interesting in 2020 is of course, you had a major decline in GDP. So you do see um, uh, an increase in volatility in this graph on the blue line but agriculture did not show an increase in volatility. The agricultural sector helped again support economies through the COVID period and continues. Okay, over to you, Keith, please. Thanks, Louise. Um, so I would like to take a few minutes to just zero in on some of the growth performance in the agricultural sector, specifically in agriculture uh, in Africa and highlight a second major finding from the BIFAD report is that agricultural growth in sub-Saharan Africa, despite its uh, improved performance, still relies heavily on simply bringing more cropland into production. And that in order to sustain this growth over the long term and really move economies toward economic transformation, agricultural growth will need to transition 
from this resource dependent growth to productivity led agricultural growth. Carol, next slide, please. So just to review some of this history and looking at not only total growth, but where that growth is coming from and compare Africa with the experience of developing countries as a whole. We do see, so these two bars for each of these graphs show total growth for two periods in agriculture. So this is average annual growth rate in the three decades prior to 1990 and the three decades since 1990. And you can see that across all developing countries, agriculture was growing on average at about 3% per year in real terms. But in most developing countries, there was a major transition in where that growth came from. In other words, instead of coming from bringing more land or intensifying inputs on existing land, uh, more and more of that growth came from raising what we call total factor productivity. In other words, if we look at the total output for uh, relative to the amount of total land labor and capital inputs, uh, developing countries were getting that increase and that growth out of raising total productivity. And a lot of that is coming from technical innovation, uh, improved efficiency in the use of inputs, adoption of new technology. Sub-Saharan Africa, now we see did increase growth performance from a very low 2% to over 3%. And as Louise pointed out in the last two decades to almost 4% in, GDP, in, in agricultural value added terms. But that growth relies heavily on resource expansion, especially bringing in more cropland rather than raising yields on that cropland or rather than raising that total productivity, that green part of those bars. Now, what do we know about the growth process is that to get a, an, an agricultural sector that's uh, productivity led requires sustained innovate, investments in innovation. At a core of this innovation system are public investments in agricultural research and development. And this is a way that agriculture really differs from other sectors of the economy in that we need this locally adapted technology suitable for local farming systems, uh, local agrological conditions, and you can't simply import technology directly. So we need this local or national capacity in agricultural research to do that adaptation. In addition, as Mike mentioned in his opening remarks, very important is this enabling environment so that new technologies, once they're developed, can rapidly disseminate and be adopted by farmers. And that enabling environment includes extension services as well as uh, market reform so that prices can signal resource allocation. And of course, we need that market infrastructure, rural roads, so that farmers, when they increase surpluses, you know, can bring their produce at low cost to market. Uh, next slide, please, uh, Carol. So despite this sort of lagging performance in productivity, well, First, I'd like to just highlight um, the underinvestment in agricultural R&D that has been pervasive in Africa for several decades. And in this fig and these figures, I show th four measures of agricultural research in Africa relative to other developing regions, Latin America, West Asia, North Africa, and Asia here refers to South and East Asia. So whether you look at total public investment by all the countries in the region in agricultural R&D, whether you look at R&D as a percentage of agricultural GDP or R&D per farm worker or R&D per hectare of crop land, Africa has lagged behind other developing regions. And this, uh, you know, as Tom mentioned, is one of the key, you know, key criterion, a necessary condition to sustain productivity growth in agriculture. Next slide, please, Carol. Now, despite this sort of lagging performance in productivity-led growth, we do see, and we highlight in this report, some countries that appear to be making a successful transition, and we, and we uh, uh, delve down a little bit into what those countries are doing in terms of policies that appear to be uh, causing that transition to a productivity-led growth. And one of these emergent success stories is Ethiopia. You know, Ethiopia is a very poor country 
had decades of political uh, instability uh, within the country and conflict, but in the early 1990s was able to reestablish peace and macroeconomic stability within their country. And they embarked explicitly on a policy of what they called agriculturally led industrialization. Investing in the agricultural sector, they were able to accelerate growth and sustain growth at over 5% per year since the early 1990s. Now, a lot of that growth has come from resource expansion, more land and labor in production, but we also see movement toward raising productivity of those resources. And we see evidence of adoption of improved crop varieties, better use of fertilizers and so forth uh, by farmers, by smallholder farmers in Ethiopia. And this period of accelerated agricultural and economic growth was associated with substantial improvements in welfare indicators, reductions in poverty, reductions in child stunting, and, and a fall, a significant fall in the proportion of the population that were food insecure. And that's basically the proportion of the population not getting even 2000 calories a day for consumption. A second case story, uh, uh, next slide please, Carol. Another important success story, emerging success story is Ghana. Now this Ghana is in a very different part of Africa. So now we're moving from the highlands of East Africa to the lowlands on uh, Guinea Savannah of Ghana. Now in the 1980s, Ghana too was able to enact a series of political and economic reforms that established stability and good conditions for growth. And they were able to accelerate agricultural growth to almost 4% per year in the decades since then. And especially over the last decade, we see agricultural growth really coming from raising total productivity of those agricultural resources. And we see evidence again of adoption of improved crop varieties and farming practices, and even sometimes the spread of new crops uh, in Ghana and in the report, we focus especially on what's been going on in Northern Ghana, the Guinea Savannah area, uh, historically the most impoverished part of the country. And there we also see this strong correlation between increased agricultural growth and productivity and declining rates of poverty and child stunting. And in just one decade, the incidence of extreme poverty and child stunting were cut in half in Northern Ghana. Uh, next slide, please, Carol. So what did these countries do that enabled them to move toward this growth path and moving toward a productivity-led growth path for agriculture? Well, critical were investments in innovation. Both countries essentially doubled their spending in agricultural R&D uh, early in this growth process. And Ethiopia in particular built Africa's largest agricultural extension service. Both countries also liberalized markets, letting prices uh, for agricultural products uh, float to equate supply and demand and help guide resource allocation in the economy. Both countries invested in rural infrastructure to connect smallholder farmers uh, to markets. And as I mentioned, uh, and, and Louise mentioned, macroeconomic and political stability were very important in stimulating that enabling environment for growth in these economies. So we see in Africa, when these sets of policies are Im implemented and sustained, that it is certainly possible to move, to accelerate agricultural growth among smallholder growers and get these kinds of inclusive economic growth processes that are so important for successful economic transformation. Well, thank you very much. I'd now like to turn over the presentation to my colleague, Ade Soji Adelaja. Soji, over to you. Thank you, Keith. Um, uh, Louise um, made a very strong point that um, uh, Africa went through significant economic growth and agricultural growth simultaneously pre-COVID and that the growth was consistent with the principles of economic transformation. And I, th I think Keith made the point that there's a need to transition to productivity-led growth. What I want to do is to highlight the importance of resilience to shocks and stressors, which seem to have emerged strong as um, 
um, things that have the potential to really, really negatively affect the future of not only agriculture, but the overall economies of Africa. Um, if you go back and look over the last 10 years, you see that the incidence of both conflict, and I'm talking about things like terrorism and talking about things like um, um, pastoral violence and things like that, in a sense, those things have really been stepped up in recent years. Also, uh, there's a growing incidence of things like droughts that really directly affect agriculture and food security. The evidence is very strong on those two grounds. Um, so how does one deal with the fact that the incidence of these things continue to rise? I think it's all about building resilience. Uh, African economies have to step up their capacity to mitigate the effects of these negative shocks, not only from climate and conflict, the conflict but also economic shocks, um, which threaten stability, livelihoods, and create poverty and also affect food security. Now we need to understand that these things are also root causes, if you see what I mean, for uh, for conflict in the, in the first place. In other words, the absence of food security, uh, limited livelihoods, poverty, these things create kind of a feedback loop or a virtual uh, uh, cycle, uh, which erodes the process of economic transformation. Um, there's evidence that African countries, while they may be resilient or be built, have been building up their resilience, uh, also, the resilience levels are not high enough. And this may explain why some of the countries are in fact fragile. So the point, basic point that I'm trying to make is that resilience thinking, resilience strategies, principles of resilience need to be considered as we talk about this transformation and this transition toward productivity led agriculture uh, in Africa. And that's it, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Soji. Uh, Carol, next slide, please. Okay, uh, this is our last slide, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, before we hand uh, back to Lulama. So um, we're just trying to focus on the way forward and give uh, some ideas, uh, both for African governments as well as development partners about uh, the way forward. Uh, so we stress that these five bullet points here are not sufficient conditions, but they are necessary, and that there really has been uh, under provision of these uh, aspects for uh, a long time, and that will really need to change. So the first one is strengthening national uh, R&D systems, agricultural R&D systems. Um, the second one is improving the coordination between the national and the international R&D systems. The international R&D system has a lot of uh, uh, good technologies and practices that can be um, brought into uh, different environments in Africa, but they need to be adapted. And given all of the diversity of farming systems uh, in Africa, uh, this adaptive R&D system can't really be done by international systems. It has to be done by the national R&D systems. And so this coordination aspect is crucial. Uh, John Lynham, I think, is going to be talking a lot more about this when he, uh, when he comes. Third issue is strengthening extension systems, both public and private. Uh, Keith showed uh, how Ethiopia has made great progress in promoting uh, total factor productivity growth in agriculture. It's not a coincidence that Ethiopia has half of all of Sub-Saharan Africa's extension workers, that one country. Fourth issue is policy. Uh, I think we all agree that in order to get the incentives uh, for African farmers to adopt uh, um, a new technologies and new practices, the policies need to be in place that allow the private sector to bring these technologies closer to farmers uh, and to promote adoption. And then lastly is this point about capacity. Um, you know, good R&D systems and good extension systems don't just come out of nowhere. Uh, we have to have well-trained uh, local people to um, uh, man and, um, you know, provide the, 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 the person power for 
uh, these institutions to, to function uh, well. And this brings in questions about how to develop the capacity locally uh, to um, enable these institutions to benefit from good staff. So these are not new recommendations. They've been around for a long time, but they are important ones. Uh, and um, our hope is that uh, we can get a co kind of a coalition of support around mobilizing support for these uh, interventions. Chair, thank you so much uh, for uh, allowing us to talk about these issues, give the floor back to you, all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Tom, Luis, Keith, and Soji for really setting the scene well. What strikes me from your presentation is the key message of agricultural center, central role in really driving economic transformation in sub-Saharan Africa, and this need for the region to transition from resource dependent to productivity-led growth. This evidence that you've presented has really set us up nicely to now really turn our attention to addressing the how. Right? How does Sub-Saharan Africa make that transition? Where should we be focusing our investments? And I know, Tom, you and your team, you've alluded to the necessary condition of technical innovation, but what types of partnerships are needed to effectively develop the necessary local adaptive technologies. And to really help us tease this out a bit, we have a distinguished panel of experts with us today. Starting with Dr. Aparajita Goyal, a senior economist in the office of the Chief Economist, Africa Region of the World Bank. Aparajita's work focuses on microeconomic issues of development with a particular emphasis on agriculture productivity, poverty, shared prosperity, technological innovations, and digital economies. Also joining us today, we have Professor Kevin Urama, the Senior Director of the African Development Institute and formerly Senior Advisor to the President of the African Development Bank. Kevin has served as the inaugural Managing Director of the Quantum Global Research Lab. He, has the, he was the Executive Director of the African Technology Policy Studies Network and also the inaugural president of the African Society for Ecological Economics. Welcome, Kevin. And finally, we have Dr. John Lynham, emeritus scientist at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture. Dr. Lynham has over 30 years experience in tropical agriculture, research in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, and Asia. He has served as the economist in in the cassava program at CIAT from 1977 to 1988. And he then joined the food security division of the Rockefeller Foundation based in Nairobi, Kenya, where he worked till 2004. So a warm welcome to you all. And I'm really looking forward to a rich discussion this afternoon, this morning. So to begin, I would like to invite Aparajita to please share with us some further evidence and in so doing, address our first question on what can African governments and international development partners do to rapidly and sustainably improve the capacities of government ministries and agencies to promote that technical innovation, that critical condition or that necessary condition of technical innovation on African farms in order to then effectively respond to major shocks and stressors affecting Africa's food system. Aparajita, welcome and over to you. Thank you, Lilama. And uh, first of all, thank you so much uh, for inviting me. I wanted to bring together policy lessons from two recent reports that very much place some of these questions at the heart of the analysis. The first book here looks at public spending priorities for boosting agricultural productivity growth in Africa, really sort of asking the question how much African governments are spending on agriculture, what do they spend on, and how can we improve the efficiency of scarce public resources? The second book looks um, into the science, technology, and innovation agenda, really sort of providing practical recommendations for boosting both the generation and adoption of new technologies. So the main messages are really kind of clustered around three broad themes. Next slide. We all know that African governments have you know, politically signed up to certain CAD of targets, right? Uh, such as allocating 10% of total public spending to ag and raising the agriculture growth rate to 6% at the country level. And so we show that, you know, first of all, 
not only are most of the African governments uh, not spending enough on agriculture, they also, their budgets also tend to have a pretty narrow scope. Next slide. Input subsidy programs, for example, dominate public, spe public spending in many countries in Africa. And there's a real need to kind of reprioritize the composition of spending towards high return public good investments. The one category of spending that consistently leads to high returns is investments in agar and d Next slide. You know, we find that benefit cost ratios are in the range of three and four. And even in small countries, uh, the benefits are high enough to justify some sort of investment around adaptive research. And more importantly, you know, national and international systems are very much seen as complementary. So when you have stronger national ag research systems, there's greater impact uh, from technologies that emanate from the international system due to greater diffusion. And yet, if you look at what's happening to spending on ag r and next slide, it's actually going um, in the opposite direction, right? It's actually shrinking in absolute terms. So there's this innovation paradox, if you will, in the agriculture sector, where the activities and the investments that have been consistently shown to have high returns are not the ones that are necessarily being prioritized by African governments in their budgets. Second, uh, we go into uh, ways or modalities to discuss or improve the functioning of national ag systems. Next slide. And here there are sort of three elements that we particularly focus on. The first is around stable and diversified sources of financing. The second is around incentives to scientists, right? Both in terms of recruiting and retaining talent. And the third is making research aligned towards user needs. I mean, the good news is that, you know, not all the burden needs to fall on the public sector. So the private sector is actually becoming increasingly active in this space. And we really need, sort of need to think creatively about public-private partnerships that can address some of these key elements um, in terms of, um, uh, you know, improving the functioning of uh, national ag systems. The third is, you know, very often, and we all agree that um, a sustainable you know, ad productivity growth requires the steady supply of new technologies. But, you know, farmers need to be willing and able to adopt them. Next slide. And so the demand side of this um, innovation equation is critically important. And we, you know, look at sort of on the ground constraints that prevent farmers from adopting some of these, you know, great technologies. Uh, so for example, you know, information asymmetries, or credit market constraints or tenure insecurity are just some of the constraints that farmers face on the ground that might prevent them from adopting these new technologies. And so again, we kind of you know, provide practical interventions, recommendations that can help alleviate some of these on the ground constraints, you know, be it through digital technologies in improving extension services, um, you know, land rights or human capital investments. Again, I'm happy to you know, uh, discuss more in detail as the program advances. Um, but I do wanna also thank uh, Keith Fugley and Tom Jane for collaborating on both of these books. And just wanna uh, you know, say that both of these books are available freely um, on the World Bank website. And they sort of really kind of put together some of the state of the art empirical evidence around these issues, but also practical recommendations um, around um, uh, you know, policy reform. Let me stop here, back to you. Thanks. Thank you, Aparajita, for really clearly demonstrating this need for increased investments in agriculture R&D. You know, as Tom mentioned earlier, that this is not a new message, but given the evidence you've just presented, this message really bears repeating. And as you showed us, you know, investments in knowledge generation are shrinking in sub-Saharan Africa, and that's a worrying trend. And so to that end, Kevin, I'd like to turn to you and ask you, given your experience, what do you think African governments and international development partners can do to improve the capacity of our national government ministries and agencies to promote uh, technical innovation? Kevin, over your thoughts. Thank you, uh, Lulama, and uh, thanks to all the uh, panelists and also the delegates. I think a lot of the points have already been raised in the presentations and by the immediate uh, speaker just before me. 
we've all heard now how agricultural productivity is heavily dependent on technical innovations in that sector. But when you look at Africa, we find that Africans are not investing, African governments are not investing um, quite enough in uh, technical innovations and in the agricultural uh, sector in general. We do have you know, uh, continental agreements that has been reached, um, like in the Maputo Declaration, to invest 10% of GDP uh, in the agricultural sector. But this is not happening. African governments are still investing less than 1% of agricultural GDP on agricultural R&D. And we all know that uh, research and innovation, uh, research and development drives innovation, drives the technology that we haven't all talking about. So the summaries that Tom gave, uh, basically not new messages, but key messages that we seem to have been missing out, especially endogenizing that message and uh, African governments stepping up to invest in making R&D work for Africa, agricultural extension work for Africa, building agricultural uh, policy research institutions so that we can have home-led, homegrown policies that are addressing the agroecological systems and peculiarities of the continent. So my first uh, uh, recommendation would be for the African governments to demonstrate political commitment by uh, investing in natural agricultural R&D, extension, and technology development. It's not all the time that technologies developed from outside are adapted to different agroecological systems. And the, the points we have seen now with regard to low technology adoption is all a clear testimony that we need to invest more in building local capacity to be able to develop our own technologies and to do that, we need the right policies, the right regulatory frameworks, the right incentives, local content policies that will prioritize technologies that are homegrown and developed in Africa, for Africa, to ensure that that sector can grow. Another major thing that needs to be done by governments is to focus on building national agricultural innovation systems. If we don't have the systems and the framework conditions, the education system, the research systems, the, the, the uh, technology development and uh, innovation incubation systems, there are several things within national systems of innovation that Africa still needs to do quite a lot uh, in order to uh, um, uh, be able to um, grow that technological capacity within the continent. And Tom and co have already raised uh, the issue about prioritizing demand driven and adaptive agricultural research and innovation and technology capacity development on the continent. Given COVID-19, one of the other things we've seen is that IT systems, digital systems, actually help to spur innovation, especially amongst youths and women of Africa. They've risen to the challenge in many other sectors and agriculture is a sector that you find a lot of social innovations happening. So governments need to prioritize that digitization, creating the infrastructure that would allow digital innovations to, to happen. The information technology infrastructure that's required, these are roles that governments need to, do, to play in order to allow the private sector, the African youth and women and global partners to come in and play in this sector. And then of course, this cannot not happen without active participation of the private sector. So governments also need to focus a lot more on creating enabling policies that allow the private sector to come in and de-risking investments in this sector, in technology development, in technology transfer on, into the continent um, uh, will be another key thing that needs to be done. And the final point I'd like to make uh, is what I've already talked about. Let's focus on the greatest asset for Africa, the Africa's youths and women. African youths make up to 60% of the African population. 45% um, of them are below 25 years of age, they are very innovative and are always um, pushing the frontiers, trying to create social innovations to, to happen. So we need to change our land use systems. We need to have targeted policies and public investment platforms that will allow um, this kind of innovation and unleash the innovative capacity of the African youth and women uh, to be able to drive the systems forward. Thank you.
Great. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. I always uh, appreciate the points that you raise in these conversations. I especially liked as an African, I have to say, this, this notion of endogenizing this message. And it really does put the onus on our us as Africans and our national governments to really drive this agenda and these points that you've raised. So now that we've heard from both uh, Aparajita and Kevin, what we would like to do now is to turn it over to our our audience by going through a polling question. So as you guys can see on the screen, the question that we're asking is given the conversation that we are having so far and the evidence that's been presented, in your opinion, which factors are the most important in contributing to high performance public agricultural research institutes in Africa? Is it A, institutional autonomy, performance incentives for scientists, stable and diversified funding, public-private partnerships, international R&D linkages, management accountability, or human or organizational capacity. Please select three. So the poll is open. And we would like to watch in real time. What does our audience think? Okay. It's looking as stable and diversified funding is coming out as top. Let's just see. We see performance incentives for scientists, uh, public partnerships, private partnerships, human and organizational capacity. So while these responses are coming in, Kevin, I'd like to turn it over to you and say, as you're watching these results come in, which would be the three that you would have chosen? Thank you very much. I think there's a high level of agreement um, from what I've just said and what I'm here seeing from the poll. Having stable and diversified funding for Africa is definitely uh, number one and in, my, in my own categorization. And that stable and uh, uh, diversified funding is for me, a larger share of it needs to come from Africa, the African private sector and the African government. The second one, of course, is public-private partnerships because without prob uh, private sector uh, playing in the, in the sector, uh, it will be very difficult for governments, given the, fis the limited fiscal space in Africa, to fund the whole uh, innovation systems that I've been talking about. And finally, human organizational capacity, building institutions, building organizational capacity uh, is definitely um, uh, for me, it's, it, it will have a tie with the number one, because even if you have all the funding and you don't have the institutional capacity, you can't endogenize the innovations and will continue to have to struggle with innovation diffusion on the continent. Thank you. Oh, great. Thank you for that. Uh, Parajita, your thoughts on this? Is this how, given where our audience is polling, is this how you would have chosen? Yes, I think this is a, a pretty good um reflection of, of my uh, preferences as well. Uh, and, um, you know, I think, I think the question about prioritization is a good one. Like we all know, I think what needs to, to be done. And I think the how is important. And I think the focus on implementation of some of these recommendations is, is important. Great, thank you. And thank you to the audience for, for providing us your insights and your thoughts on this. And uh, this is gonna be get recorded and stored. So thank you for participating. Now, what I'd like us to do now is to move on. And in doing this, I would like to invite our next panelist, Dr. John Lanham, to our virtual podium to address the second question that we're asking our panelists. So Dr. Lynam, it's widely understood that the international and national agricultural research systems play an important and highly complementary role in promoting productivity, enhancing technical innovation on African farms. Given your experience, do we have the right balance in support, in our support to international research and national agricultural research and development and extension systems. And related to that question, in your opinion, how can we achieve greater coordination between the international and African national agricultural research systems so that these systems result in greater technical innovation on African farms and in the wider food system? John, welcome and over to you.
yeah, it's, uh, it's good to unmute. Um, first, a warning, my, uh, my Wi-Fi seems to be a bit unstable, uh, but it comes back after about 10 or 15 seconds. And what I want to focus on is essentially Tom's last slide of uh, how to think about an R&D institutional architecture in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I have quite limited time, so I'll just focus on one or two uh, comments for each of the slides. But uh, you should read uh, you should read the rest of the of the of the slide. So this first slide simply draws on Carl Eicher, and I, I will focus on these three uh, institutions for a functioning R and D system in Sub-Saharan Africa. Eicher basically are is that there must be a balanced capacity in each leg of this uh, three-legged stool. And there must be functional horizontal interaction between, between all three. Next slide, please. But uh, currently, as, as has been stressed, um, currently each institution faces quite different capacity constraints as, as discussed here uh, for, the, for the three. Next slide, please. As uh, Aparajita uh, sort of emphasized in, in her slide, um, capacity development in Sub-Saharan Africa faces the, uh, the small country problem. And this is argued in the past for regional approaches to particularly capacity development uh, in, uh, in, in, on the continent. Next slide, please. Over time, there's been a continuous search for vertical integration between the CGIAR and national programs. The closest to a functional integration was a brief period at the turn of the century with SROs as key coordinators in this uh, integration between the CG and, and national systems. Next slide, please. Next slide. Um, okay, it says my, my, my Wi-Fi is a bit unstable. There, there are a number of drivers in this loss of an integrated architecture, particularly the move of donors away from regional approaches and the move of the CGIR downstream, forcing a, a disarticulation between the CG and particularly NARIs on the continent. Next slide, please. The, the, oops, back to the slide. Yes. The argument then is for a coordinated change agenda involving NARS, CGIR, and aid agencies. This agenda, as expressed here in this slide, focuses on capacity development in all three legs of the R&D stool, a return to regional approaches and dedicated capacity development programs, uh, but with a central question of whether there can be a coordinated shift to systems research in African R&D, particularly as expressed in the, uh, the new reform strategy of the, uh, of the uh, uh, CGIR, and as well in, in, in donor strategies. Okay, let me leave it there. Great. Uh, thank you, John, um, for your insights. I, I particularly, because I went through your slides earlier and, and what I particularly appreciated was your point on the need for uh, regional approaches and networks to address what you were calling the small country problem. And so with that, I'd like to also invite Aparajita just in one or two minutes to answer that question that John was responding to, do you believe we have the right balance in our support to international and national agriculture research and development extension systems? And how do you think we can achieve greater coordination between international and African national agricultural research systems? Aparajita, your thoughts? Yes. Mm, so, I mean, we don't have the right, uh, balance by and by that I sort of I'm referring to investments because as we've 
now seen from both the um, you know earlier authors as well as the other panelists, um, you know there is that gap. Uh, in, in sort of investments around ag r and and whether those are for national systems or for international systems, uh, you know, I think that there is a, uh, a severe investment gap. So, uh, so to that extent, um, you know, if, if, if I'm referring to the balance in terms of funding, we don't have it. And I think that there's scope for doing much more in terms of, um, uh, you know, bolstering up uh, the national research systems, I think the important point is the complementarity, that when you have strong national systems, you have greater impact from uh, the technologies that emanate from international systems. And I think that's sort of a key point to make. Uh, and there are, of course, lessons uh, that we can learn from Brazil's uh, Embrapa, for example, you know, India's experience and so on. So I think that there are success stories out there that we can draw some lessons from. Over. Great, thank you, Aparajita. Kevin, would you agree with Aparajita that we do not have this balance? And if not, how can we achieve it? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, well, definitely, I do agree with her. We don't have the right balance because for decades now, we have seen significant amounts of investments going into the agricultural systems, but we still see that the national systems, agricultural systems are heavily underfunded and quite often spend a lot of time trying to seek for the funding. So for me, the current model of financing we have mostly favor international organizations as primary grantees, and then the African institutions maybe as secondary grantees or even researchers for the researchers that have been given the grants to do the research. So the, the investments in locally and adaptive and national agricultural systems is very, very key. And I have already highlighted in my first intervention the need for Africa to invest in that quite a lot. But there are challenges for African countries even to make that investment because you find that the cost of capital is very high. The interest rates on loans because of the uh, ratings of countries the cost of capital is high, and then that makes it difficult for African governments to even invest as much as they should. So for me, I think it's not either or, there needs to be collaboration, but there needs to be a rethinking of the global uh, financing architecture to help uh, African governments to be able to balance the investments well, as opposed to the investment that goes into the CHC, CGIR systems and so on. So um, that, that's one thing. And then for me, there will also need to establish agricultural uh, uh, science, technology and innovation trust fund for Africa that needs to be centrally managed by agencies like the AFDB or the AU or whichever one we choose so that it will reduce the bottlenecks of uh, uh, people trying to get funding and running around to get funding to uh, be able to I mean, the local in institutions to, to do this. So it's a balance, but we need to uh, find ways of trying to bring the two together in order to address the challenges that we're all facing. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kevin. And just before we move on to the final question, John, do you have any further comments on this question? John, over to you. Um, you're muted if you're answering. John, it appears we might have lost John. So in the interest of time, then we'll go ahead and move on to our third and final question that I will be posing to our panelists. So before we wrap up, this final question that I would like to ask is, is really near and dear to my heart, right? As a representative of a network of African-based agricultural policy research institutes, I'm really keen to hear the insights to this question. So the question that I'm asking our panelists in these one or two minutes, I would like each panelist to share their thoughts on how can international development partners, for example, USAID, FCDO, promote effective coordination between international and African-based policy research institutes so as to enable policy analysis to translate more effectively into policy action and implementation. So starting with Kevin, 
What are your thoughts in this regard? Thank you, uh, Lulama. I think my thoughts just continues from what we've said and addressed in the first and second uh, question. First for me, uh, these agencies have been doing quite a lot. Um, we need to, they need to encourage African governments to formulate their own agendas and encourage them to uh, uh, implement them. So basically bilateral agencies, donor agencies, de development finance institutions, should be going to implement agendas that are already set, national agricultural action plans that, needs, that are developed by the countries themselves. That creates a rallying point where everyone has a common objective instead of setting agendas that we think that they need will be addressing the development goals of countries. The second one is what I've said already before, which is re refocusing our funding models to benefit longer term uh, institutional capacity development and agricultural science and technology knowledge systems that are locally owned and locally groomed. Once that is set up in that national agenda, we need to support that. And then everybody again rallies around that to help uh, bring in together so that we can achieve scale. Because what is happening now is that everyone is doing so much, but so little in different dispersed ways and we're not able to achieve the scale that is needed. So then the final one for me on this point, given I have only two minutes, is th that going back to having a, a centrally organized and implemented trust fund or multi-donor trust fund, whichever type of trust fund that we would want to consider, where all the big agencies come together, set agendas with the African governments and have um, intermediary institutions, anchor institutions within Africa implement those agendas, and then the funding can achieve the scale that I have been talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, same question for you, John. In your opinion, can um, how can international development partners really promote uh, effective coordination between the international and African-based policy research institutes to enable effective policy analysis that will translate into effective policy actions and implementation? Because this, this is us trying to really deal with that implementation issue. John, over to you. Okay, let me uh, just focus on the case of, of IFPRI. I, I, I did a review, an impact study of their, uh, their, uh, their work in science and technology. And uh, the conclusion since policy impact is essentially conditioned on country level capacity and analysis and flow through to government decision makers. Uh, the, real, the real effectiveness of the programs was when they introduced country level programs that provided a sort of a backstopping to local uh, policy research uh, capacity. And, and basically sort of filled, filled in the cracks. So, uh, you know, and, and these were primarily supported by, by USAID. Um, so the question I think going forward is that the role of IFPRI in the new reform process of the CGIR is uncertain and how policy research will be structured. So that, linkage I think is now under review and, and with, with possible changes going forward, but how is, is the question. Thank you, thank you for that. And thank you for posing these questions. You've got me thinking, <laughs> that's a very good, interesting question. Aparajita, your thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm not going to repeat because I agree with Kevin and John, so I'm, I'm not going to repeat the points that they've made, but I think one more um, uh, thing that the multilateral organizations would, I think, add value in is trying to serve as a broker between the governments and the private companies in really fostering that public-private partnership, right? Like what, what is that joint venture, for example, going to look like? You know, what are some of the elements of that partnership? Um, you know, in, in sort of gets back to the implementation and the how question, because, uh, you know, I mean, there's no silver bullet. We all, we all know that and institutional capacity building takes a long time, but, but we just have to, you know, 
keep at it, right? So we know the elements, we have to keep at it. And I think another uh, key piece that we miss, I think, in this conversation is the private sector. So bringing that in. Thanks for that. And, and I think a lot of our conversation has been weighted heavily towards, you know, governments and what can governments do. But I, I agree with you. I think we need to also be bringing in that private sector element as well, because they can, in a way, facilitate um, some of this implementation that we need. All right. Thank you, guys. I thank you to the panelists. I thank you for fielding these questions. But in the interest of time, what I would like us to do is to wrap up the panel discussion section with one more polling question for the audience. Right, next slide, please. All right, in this question, this is an open-ended question. And what we're doing is asking the, um, asking the audience, how can we, and by we, I'm talking about the collective we, donors, national governments, private sector, more effectively promote technical innovation on African farms and the broader food systems. And I'm starting to see some of the answers already coming in. So I see here better coordination and providing platforms, use local partners, public private sector to scale out and promote, remove barriers for adoption and scaling through policies, build human and institutional capacity. It's brilliant. This is exactly what our panelists have been sharing with us. All right, thank you for that. Um, I see direct delivery for farmers, processors, marketers through extension and private industry-led education and training. Great. Please keep those responses coming in because the BIFED team will be collating uh, this, this information that you're sharing with us. All right. Thank you for that. Now, just in the last few minutes, I would like us to transition to the open Q&A session. Um, I believe questions have been curated for the panelists and we'll use the last few minutes just to kind of go through some of those questions. Sorry, I'm just closing out my screen here to see. Okay, so we've got a couple of questions. Uh, one question for John, um, from John Laborde for Keith. The first question is, do you have any insights into the categories of R&D? Have the, uh, what, which categories of R&D have the largest impact on productivity increases? breeding programs, agronomy, cropping systems, mechanical systems, under the broad umbrella, umbrella of R&D, where should funding be targeted? Keith, if you would like to answer that question. Uh, yes, sure. Uh, thank you for that question. I think um, the evidence on impact of research so far has really favored the crop improvement research, uh, which includes breeding as a major component uh, but also agronomy that goes along with making, you know, getting the, the best, you know, the, the management practices to get the best potential out of crop varieties. So that's what the impact evidence really favors is that, you know, we, we're getting very high returns from crop improvement research. Now, part of that is because it tends to be a little easier to measure uh, impact of research in, in crops, uh, particularly uh, if you compare, you know, measuring impact of research on policy is much more difficult or even on nutrition. So there is some bias there, but at least what we can say is, is that the investments that are being made in crop improvement have generated and are generating high returns for African agriculture. Can or oh, apologies, I was muted. Uh, we have time for just one more question. Um, this is a question from Patricia Rosenfield for anyone that's on the study team or, and or a parajita. The question is, what is the role of farmers and local communities in leading and sustaining agricultural transformation? Are these lessons from earlier discussions of the signal role of agricultural development in leading growth from work by Clifford Wharton, Vernon Runtan, Francis, uh, Ada Chaba and others in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. So um, either Aparajita or anyone on the study team, if you would like to field that question. Uh, this is Soji Elijah. Uh, I think it is important in African countries that the voice of farmers and rural people be strengthened. Um, it's very difficult for national government or government in general to 
be accountable if you don't have a very strong um, agricultural community that has voice. So I think investment of even public funds in organizing farmers so that they can help to build some of these accountability structures uh, is very, very, very important. The tendency is to see agricultural voice as a detraction from good governance by, of course, governments that are not so honest. But I think it's it has to be within the purview of government to strengthen the voice of the agricultural community. Uh, relatively speaking, in many of the countries, farmers themselves are not very wealthy, and the people that tend to be wealthy tend to be the ones that have the greatest voice. So deliberately strengthening the voice of agriculture, I think is important. Great, thank you, Soji. All right, so there's gonna be one last question and I'm going to be a bit cheeky as a moderator. I'm not, I'm supposed to facilitate conversation, not necessarily add to the conversation, but there was a question from an Emmanuel Irondi. And the question he asked was how can collaboration between research institutes universities and African governments be strengthened and backed with policies that would translate uh, into innovative research findings into action to improve food security in Africa. And I'm going to answer this question just because working in an African-based agriculture policy research institute, this is the question we do wrestle with on a daily basis. And we have to, as as an, a nationally based institute, I feel that the onus is on us really to develop that relationship with our national governments. To and we do this by ensuring that the research output that we're developing is world class. We do this by ensuring that the research we develop and engage in is relevant and answers the questions that our policymakers have. And it can demonstrate the impact of the various decisions that they have to make. So that's my short and brief answer to that. But um, Emmanuel, I'd love to follow up with you uh, maybe offline on this question. So feel free to email me this. All right, so with that now, I would really like us to turn this over to Pamela for our to make our final closing remarks. But before I do that, I'd really like to just thank the panelists and the presenters for you know the, the wonderful work and the wonderful conversation. So to introduce Pamela, uh, Dr. Pamela Anderson is a member of the BIFAD of BIFAD and previously served as the Director General of the CGIAR. International Potato Center in Lima, Peru. Dr. Anderson has also served as a senior entomologist and coordinator of the Tropical White Fly IPM program at the International Center for Tropical Agriculture in Cali, Colombia. Prior to joining the CGIAR system, Dr. Anderson spent two decades working with national programs in Latin America, including at the National Agriculture University in Nicaragua. Upon returning to the US, Dr. Anderson served as the director for the Agricultural Development Program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Dr. Anderson, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lulama, and good morning, everyone. Um, I want to start out by once more thanking the authors of this wonderful report, Tom Jane, Louise Fox, Keith Fugli, and Adesoji Adalaha. If you haven't had a chance to read the report yet, I would urge you to go do so. It's timely, it's important, it is extremely rich in data, evidence, and analysis, and it is very clear. The authors have left us with two key messages. The first one, which Luis really went over this morning, is that indeed there is an agricultural led economic transformation going on in Sub Saharan Africa. Between 2000 and 2018, as she explained, Africa had the highest agricultural growth in the world. That growth was widespread across the continent, it was resilient, and it was highly correlated with economic development in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's the good news. The second message that they have left us with, however, is that the agricultural growth that's going on in its current form in Africa is not sustainable. In that same period from 2000 to 2018, 74% of that growth, as Keith explained to us, came from area expansion more land under cultivation and only 26%, only a quarter came from agricultural productivity growth. So going forward, 
That is not sustainable if we wanna to continue to see economic transformation in the continent. The, the overarching implication of this is that Sub-Saharan Africa needs to quickly transition to an agricultural growth model that is based in agricultural productivity growth. We need to see farmers continually taking up a constant stream of improved agricultural practices and innovative technologies. And that's gonna be driven by a stronger enabling environment, infrastructure, but most particularly policy reform. And for most of the countries in the continent, this agricultural productivity agenda is going to require a much, much stronger research development and extension system. And John Lyman has, has said to us that as we go to the conversation about these implications, there's nothing new. We, we've been talking about these things for decades. We've been talking about strengthening the national systems, capacity development, policy reform. But I think what this study has laid out anew for us is why these issues are so critically important today and the urgency that we get back to them. So over the last year, um, the panel, the study team has done an incredible job in coordination with our executive uh, director and support team in rolling out and discussing around this report. Essentially, the discussion has focused on this last key message and the implications and the challenges that are around that. We've gotten to the how-to questions, and, and these are the conversations that we need to drive now. It's what we've taken up again this morning. Um, the how-to questions on how do we convince governments and development partners to increase political and financial commitment for our D and E systems, including political institutions and capacity development? How do we get better linkages and connectivity between our international and our national R&D systems? How do we turn the policy research into actions on the ground? And we had a wonderful set of panelists and a rich discussion. The messages that they were giving to us this morning is you know, Kevin and Aparita said, we absolutely need to increase the public investment, the political commitment to strengthening the RD and E systems in country. We actually are going in the wrong direction. The investments are falling. We need to see them reversed and increase. We need to lean more creatively and effectively on the private sector. And we need to get incentives to draw talent into these programs. Um, John, in talking about the linkages, in addition to saying that, yes, strengthening the RD and E system is a precursor to getting this balance. We need to have strong partners on both sides. He gave us a caution about the small countries, that we've been putting too much of our attention to some of the larger countries in Africa. And we probably need to go back to the regional organizations that were strong around 2000 and build R&D systems in those regional areas. Um, Kevin has told us in response to development partners that we really uh, would benefit from setting up a multi-trust for the African RD and E efforts, that this is going to increase efficiency and scale. So I think a lot of the conversation that we need to have now going forward, because the study is very clear and compelling, but we need to get to the how to, you know, how are we gonna compel these governments to commit, to commit politically and to increase investment? What is our role as international development partners in supporting our African colleagues? You know, as, as Lou Lama and, and Kevin said, uh, uh, in these indigenous efforts that they need to work on in their country. So there is a, a rich set of how-to questions and that's what we would like to see table and going forward as, as we continue to talk about the outcomes of this report. So I wanna thank the panelists for the very, very rich discussion and Lou Lama, for the excellent job that you did in, in moderating this, this interesting session. Um, for the last couple of minutes, I do want to go back and contextualize this study um, in the broader food systems conversation that is all around us. Um, as we go forward into this food systems paradigm, which is necessarily and appropriately more complex and complicated, we need to make sure that we do not leave this important focus on agri agricultural productivity growth behind. There are many colleagues in our community 
who truly feel that the productivity agenda is passe. That's what we did last century. We need to get onto the new business now. I think what this study has done in a very compelling way is argued that is absolutely not true. The agriculture productivity agenda is key and critical. It's the cornerstone to our food systems. And as we move forward, we can't afford to leave it behind. We need to double down. But all of us need to, at the same time, be asking more of our productivity research agenda. We cannot anymore just look at the linkages between poverty reduction and economic transformation. We need to be demanding that the productivity agenda be contributing directly and driving progress in our other goals, improve nutrition, improved resilience, improve sustainability, more equity. So we need to drill down and constantly be asking these questions. Are these practices and these technologies that we're generating through the productivity agenda, including and empowering women and youth, are they regenerating our natural resource base? Are they improving resilience? Are we drawing sufficiently on agroecology intensification? In terms of nutrition, what are the opportunities for increasing productivity, not just for the staples, but for the critical nutrient dense foods that we need in our food systems? Do we understand the linkages between productivity and increased food affordability? I think at this point, all of us have heard this horrific statistic that today, well, actually pre-COVID, 3 billion people on this planet cannot afford a minimal healthy diet. This is unconscionable. So how do we understand and guarantee that as we increase productivity, we're understanding the pathways for how that links in to increase food affordability? So we have huge challenges in front of us and even many more opportunities. So again, I want to thank the study team. I want to thank all the panelists and the moderator. Um, I'd like to thank Deputy Assistant Missioner for joining us, the World Food Prize Foundation for hosting us. Clara Cohen, our executive director, has conceptualized this session, and our BIFAD support team, led by Carmen Benson, has organized it. And mostly, we want to thank all of you who have joined us today. Thank you for your engagement through the polls, the questions, the comments. And I can see from the chat box that this conversation is going to keep going on on the sidelines, which is exactly what we wanted. So you're going to get one more email with a survey. We're asking you to please take two to three more minutes to give us feedback on this session so we can continue to improve how we're putting these forward to you and organizing. But thank you, everyone, for joining us today and for this wonderful, rich session. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.